so in this video we'll be picking up where we left off in the last video on The Fate of Ten by Pitticus Lore. I hope you guys are enjoying this series still and that uh, the books are getting, we're getting a lot closer to the end. We've got this book and then one more and the main series will be done. I know that there's a couple of books um, out, it's, it's like a spin-off or a, like a continuation type thing, but it's not part of the main series. It's like got new characters and stuff like that. I don't know if I'll be reading that. Mostly because I'm excited to like finish this actual series and then um, go on to a new series that I think you guys are going to really, really enjoy. So I hope you stick with me um, even after this is over. Uh, it's called, it's a Throne of Glass series uh, by J. A. A. Moss or something like that. Uh, blanking right now, but I, I know it's like of that, um, uh, by like Moss, so yeah, something like that. Um, but yeah, it's a really great series, and if you like this, you'll like that. It's got powers in it, even though in the first book you don't think that because it kind of gears it up in a totally different way, uh, which is pretty exciting. But, um, yeah, I hope you guys will like that one too. Uh, it's a bit, it's quite different. Um, but I like it, and I just read it for the first time not too long ago, and I'm obsessed with it, so I think it's an awesome series, so I'm looking forward to reading that after, um, this one. I think what I'll do is when I'm in the final book, um, of the series, which is, uh, United as One, when I start reading that, I'll start reading the other one, so it's like an easy transition. You guys can start listening, see if you like it, and, you know, that way it's, you know, you've got still this going on and that going on, and we'll see. We'll figure it out. Um, and I know there's a lot of you out there, uh, that have asked me, I don't even know what happened, why I stopped reading, um, Nine's novella. I will finish that. I'll probably try to record that maybe in a day or two from now, um, and then post that up at some point. I'll finish it. Um, I, I, I don't know what happened. I guess my, you know, I have really bad memory loss due to my PTSD and stuff like that. So, I don't know. I guess I just forgot that I was even reading that. I don't know what happened. So I'm so sorry, but it, it was a nice reminder from one of my uh, subscribers um, who, was, who was like, hey, it's, you know, I was listening to it. It seemed like it wasn't the end. And I was like, oh my God, that's right. I was reading that. So I will finish that. Um, and then, you know, we'll go from there. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Let's get on with the reading. We will be starting on chapter 9. The soldiers rushed us through the subway tunnels, out through the nearest station, and finally into daylight. They're constantly in a tight knot around us, a human shield, treating us like the Secret Service does the President. I let myself be hustled along, knowing that I can easily shove through them at the first sign of trouble. We don't encounter any Mogadorian patrols on the way back to their armored Humvees, and pretty soon we're rumbling through streets filled with broken chunks of building, the wreckage the result of last night's Anubis bombardment. We reach the Brooklyn Bridge quickly and without incident. On the Manhattan side, the army has set up a heavily armed checkpoint. <clears throat> Soldiers packing mounted machine guns wet watch the streets from behind a blockade of sandbags. Behind them, three rows of tanks are parked, six across on the bridge, their turrets armed with surface-to-air missiles and aimed at the sky. Helicopters laden with more missiles patrol the skies, and some muscular-looking boats sit ready in the river. If the Mogadorians try to push the bro into Brooklyn, they'll definitely encounter some resistance. Have you had to fight many off? I asked the soldier driving our Humvee as we're waved through the, sec the security checkpoint and began slowly weaving through the choke points on the bridge. None whatsoever, he replies. The hostiles have, stu have stuck to Manhattan so far. That big ship flew right over us this morning and didn't engage. You ask me, they don't want a piece of this army, boys. Sir, Daniela repeats, raising an eyebrow at me and snickering. They're holding Manhattan, I say, leaning back and frowning, not understanding why the Mogs haven't pressed their attack. It's like Satrekis Ross sending a message, Sam says quietly. Look at what I can do. 
If they come at us, we'll be ready, the soldier says, overhearing. Looking out the window, I make out I make out snipper, snipers hidden among the bridge's high struts, watching the Manhattan side of the bridge through their scopes. I exchange a doubtful look with Sam. I want to believe in this show of force by the army and echo the soldier's confidence, but I've seen what kind of destruction the Mogs are capable of. The only reason this Brooklyn camp is still standing is because Citricus Ra allowed it. The soldiers park. The soldier parks our Humvee in the middle of a city block that's been converted into a staging area for the military. There are tents nearby, more Humvees, and a lot of anxious-looking soldiers with guns. There's also a long line of civilians, many of them feeling filthy and superficially injured, clutching their scant possessions as they want wait in a haggard line. At the front of the line, some Red Cross volunteers with clipboards take down the exhausted people's information before waving them onto commandeered city buses. Our escort notices me watching the slow precision of refugees. Red Cross is trying to keep track of the displaced, the soldier explains. Then we're evacuating them to Long Island, New Jersey, wherever, getting them away from the fighting until we can retake New York. The soldier sizes up Sam and Daniela, then looks at me again. It suddenly occurs to me that this guy is looking to me for orders. Do you want these two uh, evacuated? The soldier asks, referring to my companions. They're with me, I tell him, and he nods, accepting that without further question. Daniela watches the aid workers check in an elderly couple and help them onto the bus. They have a list or something I could check? I'm looking for someone. The soldier shrugs like this isn't his area of expertise. Sure, you could ask. Daniela turns to me. I'm gonna... Go, I say, nodding. I hope you find her. Daniela smiles at Sam, then me, and starts to turn her way away. Um, about the whole saving the world thing, she says, hesitating. When you're ready, come find me, I tell her. You're assuming I'll ever be ready, Daniela replies. She hasn't mention mentioned her duffel bag of stolen money since it got left behind on the subway. Yeah, I am. Daniela lingers for a second longer, eyes locked with mine. Then, nodding to herself, she turns and jogs over to hassle the Red Cross. Sam looks at me like I'm crazy. You're just letting her go? One, one of the only... Sam glances at the soldier, who's still patiently standing nearby, not sure how much he should say. I can't force her to join us, Sam, I reply. But what happened to her? What happened to you? There has to be a reason. I have faith it won't be for nothing. Agent Walker's this way, sir. The soldier says, motioning Sam and me to follow. Are cell phones working yet? I ask him as we walk through the busy camp. I need to make a call. It's important. Traditional methods are still down, sir. The hostiles saw to that. We probably got something you can use in the communication center, though. The soldier says, gesturing to a nearby tent bustling with activity. I'm supposed to bring you directly to Agent Walker, though, if you'll allow it. If I'll allow it? We were briefed on your history of difficulty with authority, the soldier says, sheepishly examining the handle of his rifle. We were told not to, dis not to engage in combat or force, you or, or force you to do anything. Mission parameters are limited to uh, gently prodding. I shake my head in disbelief. It wasn't too long ago that I was considered an enemy of the state. Now I'm being treated like a foreign digni dignitary by the army. All right, I say, deciding not to make life difficult for our escort. Point me in the direction of Agent Walker and then help my friend Sam get his hands on a satellite phone. Moments later, I walk along the concrete pier overlooking the East River and Manhattan. The air is crisp and cool, although still tinged with the acrid, burned smell that blows in from Manhattan. From here, I have a clear view of the destruction the Mogadorians wrecked on the city. Pillars of dark smoke rise into the blight the bright blue sky, fire still burning. There are gaps in the city skyline, spaces where I know buildings should be, simply erased by the powerful in energy weapons of the Anubis. Occasionally, I can make out a skimmer zipping between buildings, the mogs patrolling the streets. Agent Walker stands alone at the railing, staring out at the city. How'd you find me? I ask by way of greeting as I approach. The FBI agent, who once tried to have me imprisoned, actually smiles at me. Some survivors tr trickling in mentioned to seeing you. Walker answers. We sent teams out to the general area. Figured we'd start looking where the Alpha warship was dropping heavy ordnance. Good call, I reply. Glad you're alive, she says briskly. Walker's gray-streaked red hair is pulled back in a tight ponytail. She looks exhausted, heavy bags under both of her eyes. At some point, she traded in her cus customary FBI windbreaker and pantsuit for a Kevlar vest and fatigues, probably borrowed from the large army contingent securing this area. Her left arm is in a sling, and there's a hastily bandaged gash on her forehead. 
Do you want me to heal those for you? I ask. In response, Walker takes a look around. The two of us are alone for the moment, standing in the small park tucked underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, or rather, alone as one can get in what's basically become a refugee camp overnight. The hilly lawn behind us is cluttered with makeshift tents, wounded and frightened New Yorkers packed in tight. I guess the these are the people who refuse to be evacuated by the Red Cross, or else are too injured to make the trip. The tents spread out into the surrounding blocks, and I'm sure there are people squatting in the fancy riverfront apartment buildings nearby. Interspersed throughout their survivors. Keeping order and tending to the wounded are soldiers, cops, and a few medics. Just a small part of the force of thousands I saw gathered closer to the bridge. It's essentially organized chaos. Those powers of yours have limits? Walker asks, watching as a woman sprawled in the park's grass has, ha has her severely burned arm treated by a hairy doctor. Yeah, I hit them pretty hard yesterday, I reply, rubbing the back of my neck. Why do you ask? Because much as I appreciate the offer, we've got thousands of injured here, John. We're more trick we're with more trickling in every hour. You wanna spend your whole day patching people up? I stare out over the rows of people in the park, many of them resting on nothing more than grass. A lot of them are watching me. I'm still not comfortable with this, being the face of the guard. I turn back to Walker. I could, I say. It would save some lives. Walker shakes her head and gives me a level look. The badly injured are in the tri triage tent. We can stop by later if you want to do the whole Mother Teresa thing. But you and I both know there are better ways to be spending your time. I don't reply, but I don't press the issue any further. Agent Grunt Walker grunts and walks along the pier, heading towards a collection of army tents set up in a nearby plaza. I take another quick look around the park, crossing over the bridge. Things look pretty scary. Sick secure. Back here, though, it's absolute madness. Injured people, soldiers, military officials. I don't even know where to begin. I might be in over my head. So you're in charge here? I ask Walker, attempting to get my bearings. She snorts. You're kidding, right? There are five star generals on the scene planning counter operations. The CIA and the NSA are here, coordinating with people in Washington, trying to make sense of the intel that's coming in from around the world. They had the president on video conference earlier this afternoon from whatever bunker the Secret Service spirited him off to. I'm just an FBI agent, very much not in charge. Okay, if that's the case, why did you bring me to you, Walker? Why are we talking? Walker stops and turns to me, her hands on her hips. Because of our history, our relationship, that's what you're calling it? I've been named your liaison, John, your point of contact. Anything you can tell us about the Mogadorians, their tactics, this invasion, that goes through me. Likewise, for any request you might have of the U.S. Armed Forces. I let out a sharp, humorless laugh. I wonder where the generals are set up. I scan the nearby tents, looking for one that appears more important than the others. No offense, Walker, but I don't need you as a go-between. Not up to you, she replies, resuming her walk along the pier. You have to understand that the people in charge, the president, his generals, what's left of his cabinet, they weren't Mog Pro people. When the Mogs made contact, we almost had a glorified coup on our hands, with the Mog Pro scum advocating surrender. Luckily, with Sanderson out of the picture... Hold up, what happened to him? I ask. I lost track of the Secretary of Defense during the battle with Citrekis Ra. He didn't make it, Walker replies grimly. I had enough people in Washington to get rid of most... Oh, I had enough people in Washington to get rid of most of the bad apples. The ones we knew about, at least. So you're saying MogPro is mostly gone and we're left with... A fractured government that's been kept totally in the dark. This invasion, the idea of aliens from outer space attacking us, it's all new to them. They accept that you're fighting on our side, but you're still an, an extraterrestrial. They don't trust me, I say, unable to keep the bitterness out of my voice. Most of them don't even trust each other anymore. And anyway, you shouldn't trust them. Walker replies emphatically. The known members of Mog Pro have, been, have all been arrested, killed or gone underground, but that doesn't mean we got them all. I give Walker a look, rolling my eyes. So better for me to stick with the devil I know, huh? She opens her arms, obviously not really expecting me to hug her. That's right. All right, here's my first request, liaison, I say. The Anubis, that's the warship that left New York this morning. It's carrying Satrekis Raw and is on its way to Mexico. Oh, good, Walker interrupts. They'll like that. One less threat in U.S. airspace. They need to scramble jets, fighters, drones, whatever they've got, I continue. It's headed to the place of, uh, to a place of great power, a Loric place. I'm not sure what Citrekis Ra wants there, but I know it's bad if he gets it. We need to take the fight to him. Walker's expression darkens the more I talk. I can already tell that I'm not going to like whatever she's got, got to tell me. She leads me off the pier, across some matted grass, and stops in front of a canvas tent slightly isolated from the others. 
A direct attack isn't going to happen, she says. Why the hell not? My headquarters, she says, pushing open the entrance flap. Let's talk inside. Inside Walker's tent is an unused cot, a cluttered table, and a laptop computer. There's a map of New York City with red lines crisscrossing it. If I had to guess, I'd bet the lines represent the path the Anubis took during yesterday's attack. Walker pulls a second map from beneath the New York one, this one, of the entire world. There are ominous black X's drawn over a bunch of major cities, New York, Washington, Los Angeles, and faraway places like London, Moscow, and Beijing. There are more than 20 cities marked in this way. Walker taps her fingers on the map. This is the situation, John, she says. Every marking is one of their warships. You know how to bring one of those things down? I shake my head. Not yet, but I haven't tried. The Air Force tried yesterday. It didn't go well. I frown. I saw them flying in. I know they didn't make it. They had some success against the smaller ships, but they didn't even get close to the Anubis. The Air Force was considering another strike when the Chinese all went all in. What does that mean? A couple hours after the attack on New York, they got trigger happy. We're probably worried that... They might be attacked next. They threw everything short of a nuke at the warship over Beijing. And? Casualties in the tens of thousands, Walker answers. The warship still in the air? They're shielded somehow. Chinese scientists say it's some kind of electromagnetic field. They got tired of chase crashing jets up against it, so they tried parachuting a small force directly onto the warship. Those guys didn't survive contact with the field. I'm reminded of the force field surrounding the Mogadorian base in West Virginia. The shock I received from touching it was enough to knock me out and make me sick for days. I've, I've run into their force fields before, I tell Walker. Literally. How'd you break them down? Never did. Walker gives me a deadpan look. And here I was getting my hopes up. I look back at Walker's map and shake my head. Every black X looks to me like a fight I don't know how to win. 25 cities under attack. You have any good news, Agent Walker? That's just it, she says. This is the good news. I raise an eyebrow at her. Some places, like London and Moscow, sent troops to fight the Mogs, but the response is nothing like here on Beijing or Beijing. No bombardment, no rampaging monsters. It's like the Mogs are taking it easy on them. And then there are the places like Paris and Tokyo that didn't put up any fight at all. Those cities aren't under attack aren't actually under attack. The warships and scout ships are controlling the airspace, but other than that, there aren't any mogs on the ground. And then, this morning, that warship flies right over us like we're nothing. It's got some people thinking maybe they don't want to fight. Maybe it's all just a big misunderstanding with the aliens, that we shouldn't have attacked them first. We didn't, I snap. I know that, but around the world, what they saw... So Trekus Ross sending a message, I say. Even though he's got the advantage, he doesn't want a, a pro protracted fight. He wants to frighten humanity into submission. He wants us to give in. Walker nods and walks over her to her laptop. She enters a series of passwords, no easy task considering she's typing one-handed, before finally pulling up an encrypted video. You're more than right, you know, Walker says. It's not clear how he got access, but this video appeared via secure channels in the president's private inbox. Other world leaders we've talked to have reported receiving the same thing. Walker clicks the play button, and an HD-quality image of Satrekis Ra's face appears on the screen. My blood runs cold at the sight of his pale skin and empty black eyes, at the purple scar that encircles his neck, at the smug way he smiles into the camera. It's the exact same smile he wore right before chucking me into the East River. Satrekis Ra is seated in the ornate commander's chair on the Anubis. I remember seeing it when Ella showed me around the ship. Over his shoulder... New York City is visible through a massive floor-to-ceiling window. The sun is rising. The city's still in flames. There's no doubt in my mind he chose this background on purpose. Respected leaders of Earth, Satrekis Ra begins, though these polite words issued in a scratchy rumble. I pray that this message finds you open-minded after the unfortunate events in New York and Beijing. It was with great reluctance, and only after an attempted assassination by alien terrorists, that I used a fraction of the available Mogadorian force against your people. You're the alien terrorists, by the way, Walker says. Yeah, I got that. So Trekus Ra continues. Despite these regrettable circumstances, my offer to embrace humanity and show it the way of Mogadorian progress still stands. I am nothing if not forgiving. While my forces will continue to hold New York City and Beijing as a reminder of what happens when inconsiderate beasts bite a gener gently guiding hand, the other cities where my warships are positioned have nothing to fear. Assuming, that is, my generals receive unconditional surrender from these governments within the next 48 hours. My head whips around to Walker. 
They're not actually buying this shit, are they? She points at the screen. There's more. In addition, Zetrekis raw in tones, I believe the United States government is currently harboring the Loric terrorists known as the Guard. To continue assisting these twisted souls will be considered an act of open war. They are to be turned over to me at the time of surrender, in the interest of avoiding the costly and painful process of rooting them out. It is also my understanding that some humans may have suffered a mutation at the hands of the guard wherein they will manifest certain unnatural abilities. These humans are to be turned over to me for treatment. What does he mean about mutations? Walker asks me. More bullshit? I don't reply. Instead, I back away from the laptop while Satrekis Ra is still talking, my gaze shifting towards Agent Walker. You have 48 hours to surrender, or I will have no choice but to relieve humanity of your foolish leadership and liberate your cities by force. The clip stops and Walker turns to face me. When she does, I've already got a small fireball prepared, hovering it above just the palm of my hand. Oh, Jesus Christ, John. She groans, leaning away from the, the heat. Is that why you brought me here? I snap at her, backing up. I'm half expecting a group of soldiers to burst in and try to restrain me, so I keep one eye on the tent's exit as I move towards it. Are my friends safe? Do you think I showed you that as a prelude to an ambush? Calm down. You're safe. I stare at Walker for another couple of seconds. At this point, I don't really have much choice but to trust her, especially considering the alternative is fighting my way through an army. If the government wanted to trade me to Satrekis Ra as a, good, a gesture of goodwill, it probably would have already happened. I extinguish my fireball and frown at Walker. So, is it true? Walker presses. What Satrekis Ra said about humans manifesting unnatural abilities. Does he mean that humans are getting legacies? I... I'm not sure how much to share with Walker. She tells me I'm safe, but it wasn't too long ago that she was chasing me across the country. Even though she claims Mog Pro have been driven underground, there are still humans out there working against us. Hell, she just told me not to trust the government. What if there are new guard all over the world, and what if a sellout like Secretary of Defense Sanderson gets to them before we can? And could I really out Sam and Daniela to Walker? I can't tell her anything, not until I've figured it out myself. I don't know what the hell he's talking about, Walker. I say after a moment. He'll say anything to get what he's after. I think she can tell I'm holding out on her. I know it's hard to accept considering our history, but I'm on your side, Walker says. For now, so is the United States. For now, what does that mean? It means no one's real eager to surrender to the alien maniac that just blew up New York. But if he starts torching more cities and we haven't figured out a way to successfully fight back, things might change. That's why your request for a military operation in Mexico isn't going to happen. For one, it's a losing proposition against the war, the warship. And two, prevailing wisdom right now is that we shouldn't openly aid you. They're hedging their bets, I say, unable to keep a sneer off my face, in case they decide to surrender. Word from the president is that all options are currently open, yes. Giving up isn't an option. I've seen... I stop myself from referencing Ella's vision of the future, figuring leg legacy-powered prophecies won't carry much weight with the hyper-practical walker. It won't end well for humanity. Yeah? You and I know that, John. But what Cetrekis Ross starts killing but when Cetrekis Ross starts killing civilians and all he wants in trade is you and the other guard, that's a course of action the president will be forced to consider. I turn away, opening up the tent flap to look outside, wondering where Sam is with the, that satellite phone. I also want to hide my face from Walker, feeling a choking panic coming on. I don't know what to do. If Satrekis Ra's deadline passes and he starts bombing another city, am I supposed to just let that happen? Do I turn myself in? Meanwhile, what do I do about his impending attack on the sanctuary? And what about Nine and Five, who are still unaccounted for? It's too much to handle. John? Slowly I face Walker, making sure my expression is neutral. Even so, she must detect something there, because she crosses the tent and stands right in front of me. She grabs my shoulder with her good arm, and I'm so surprised that I let it happen. There's fear in Walker's eyes, mixed with a kind of suicidal determination. I've seen that look before, worn by my friends, right before they threw themselves into battle against impossible odds. You need to tell me how to do this, Walker says to me, her voice low and shaky. Tell me how to win this war in less than 48 hours. Chapter 10 How's it going? 
Adam jumps when I put my hand on his shoulder and lean in to check on his progress. He hunches over a workbench where the mogs tweaked their weapons before pointless attempts to bring down the sanctuary's force field. Adam has swept all the mog crap that was cluttering the bench onto the ground and replaced it with an assortment of mechanical parts. The mismatched pieces come from the disabled skimmers collecting dust on the airstrip, some from within the guts of the engines, others from behind the touchscreen dashboards. Among the ship parts are other odds and ends. The battery from one of the halogen lamps, a broken down mog blaster and the ca casing of a laptop. All these things have been bent, warped, or hammered by Adam as he tries to replace our ship's destroyed conduit using spare parts. How does it look like it's going? He replies glumly, setting down the, blor the blowtorch he was about to ignite. I'm not an engineer of six. This is strictly trial and error. So far, 100% error. The sun is only now climbing above the jungle's tree line to scorch the landing strip. No reprieve from the sticky heat out here. Adam has already sweated through his shirt and the pale skin on his back, the back of his neck turning pinkish. I leave my hand on his shoulder until he sighs and turns to face me. His dark eyes are blurry and a little wild, gray circles forming around them. You didn't sleep, I say, knowing this for a fact. He worked through the entire night, his hammering and cursing, often interrupting the fitful hours of rest I managed while curled up in the skimmer's cockpit. The only breaks he took were to check on Dust, whose paralyzed condition hasn't changed. Maybe I'm not on up on my, my Mogadorian biology, but I was pretty sure you guys needed to do that. Adam brushes some hair out from his eyes, trying to focus on me. Yes, yeah, Six, we sleep, when it's convenient. You're going to push yourself to exhaustion, and then what'll you be good for? I ask. Adam frowns at me. Same thing I'm good for now, he says, glancing at the collection of trashed parts in front of him. I hear you, Six. I'm fine. Let me keep working. In truth, I'm glad Adam is so devoted to his work. As much as I don't want to see him hurt himself, we desperately need to get out of Mexico. There's no word from John. I'm afraid we're missing the war. At least eat, I tell him, yanking a light green banana off the bunch I just picked from the nearby tree and shoving it in Adam's hand. He considers the ban banana for a moment. I can actually hear Adam's stomach growl as he begins to peel it. Food wasn't something we thought to pack. We didn't know what to expect when we came to the sanctuary, but we definitely weren't planning to get stranded. We didn't bring the necessary supplies for an extended stay. You know, Nine had these stones in his chest that if you sucked on them, they'd give you all the nutrients of a meal, I tell Adam, peeling my own banana. Kind of gross, especially after you thought about where they'd been and how many times Nine probably reused them. But right now, I really wish we hadn't tossed them down that well in the sanctuary. Adam smirks, glancing over at the, at the temple. Maybe you should go back in and ask real nice. I'm sure that energy thing doesn't want Nine spit stones. Maybe I should ask it for a new engine while I'm at it. Couldn't hurt, Adam replies, and swallows the rest of his banana in a hurry. I'm going to get us out of here, Six. Don't worry. I leave a second banana on the table and let Adam get back to work. I cut across the airship, heading to where Marina sits cross-legged in the grass, facing the sanctuary. I'm not sure if she's meditating or praying or what, but she was in that spot when I woke up this morning and hasn't moved in the time that I've been out scrounging the jungle for food. I'd like to think it's an ancient... It's an accident that my route to Marina takes me by the skimmer strut where Fira, Fira Dunra is tied, but I know it's not. We've got her tied up securely in the middle of camp and have all been keeping an eye on her. I want the Mogadorian to say something, to give me an excuse. She doesn't disappoint. He's going to fail, you know. Did you say something? I ask, stopping and turning slowly to face her. I heard Fira Dunra perfectly. Our Mogadorian prisoner smiles gruesomely at me, her teeth outlined with dried blood. Her right eye is swollen shut. I did that to her last night after learning about the Mogadorian invasion. I got real tired I got real tired real quick of her incessant crackling, so I clocked her. Not my proudest moment, punching out a tied up Mogadorian, but it felt good. In truth, I probably would have done more if Marina hadn't dragged me away. As I stare at Pira Dunra, her good eye narrows in amusement. My fist clenches again. I want to hit something. All I need is a reason. You heard me, little girl. She replies, jerking her chin towards Adam. Pira Dunra projects her voice enough that I'm sure he can hear her too. Adama Sukuth will fail. As he always does. You see, I have known him much longer than you. I know what a perpetual disappointment he was to his father, to our people. It's no wonder he turned traitor. I glance over my shoulder at Adam. He's pretending not to hear Pira Dunra, but his hands have stopped working and his shoulders are bunched up. You want to get knocked out again? 
I ask Pira Dunra, taking a step towards her. She looks thoughtful for a moment and continues on. Although, hmm, something only now occurs to me. I remember hearing of young Adamus's technical prowess. He was something of a prodigy, with machines as a young trueborn. It is odd, then, that he's been unable to fix one of these ships, especially with all that equipment at his disposal. I glance again at Adam. He's turned now, a confused expression on his face, staring at Pira Dunra. I wonder if he's stalling on purpose, Pira Dunra muses. Perhaps, now that Magadorian progress has proven inevitable, he thinks keeping you here will earn him favor with our beloved leader, so that he might come crawling back to his real people. Or perhaps he is simply too much of a coward to face the losing battles to come. Adam has passed me in a blur. He crouches down in front of Pira Dunra and yanks her head back. She tries to bite him, but Adam is too quick. Death is coming for you, Adam Sukkoth. For all of you, she manages to shriek before Adam shoves a rag into her mouth. Next, he tears loose a piece of duct tape and slaps it across Pura Dunra's face. Her breath now comes in furious and forceful bursts from her nose, the Mogadorian glaring vehement, ve venomously at Adam. Over on the grass in front of the sanctuary, Marina has stood up to watch the scene play out, a small frown on her face. Adam stands over Pura Dunra, his teeth bared, dark lines caress Chris creasing his face. It's a murderous look, one I've seen on the face of many Mogadorians, usually right before they tried to kill me. Adam, I say warningly. Adam whips around to face me, trying to get control of himself. He takes a deep breath. Everything she said is a lie, Six, he says. Everything. I know that, I reply. We should have gagged her sooner. Adam grunts and returns to his workbench, his eyes downcast as he walks by me. Pira Dunra definitely knows how to get a rise out of him. Out of all of us, really. Well, except for Marina. I know she's trying to drive a wedge between our group, but it isn't going to work. How stupid does she think I am? I will always take the word of a Magadorian that was allowed to walk through the sanctuary's force field over one that tried to blow us up with a grenade. With the skirmish over, Marina sits back down in the grass before the sanctuary. I join her, watching brightly colored birds fly playful loops around the ancient temple. Would you have stopped him if I tried to kill her? Marina asks me after a moment. I shrug. She's a Mogadorian, I reply. One of the shittiest ones I've ever met, too, and that's saying something. In the heat of battle is one thing, Marina says, but when she's tied up, she is not like the warriors we've faced so many times. She's like Adam, a trueborn. When I used my healing on him, prevented him from dis disintegrating, I could, I could feel the life there, not so different from ours. I fear what we might become as this war goes on. Maybe I'm overtired, and I'm definitely beyond stress with our current situation, but Marina's moral compass thing is beginning to wear thin. When I reply, there's more harshness in my voice than I'd like. So what? You're a pacifist now? A few days ago, you stabbed out Five's eye with an icicle, I remind her. He's a lot more like us than Pura Dunra is, and they both have bad shit coming to them. Yes, I did that, Marina replies, running her hand over the sharp tips of the grass. I regret it. Or actually, I regret how little regret I feel. Do you see what I mean, Six? We have to be careful not to turn into them. Five deserved it, I reply, softening my voice a little. Maybe... Marina admits and finally looks at me. I wonder what will be left of us when this is over six. What will be what will we be like? If there's anything left of us, I reply. Big if at this point. Marina smiles sadly. She turns her gaze back to the sanctuary. I went inside the temple early this morning before the sun was up, she says. I went back to the well to where the Loric energy came from. I study Marina. While I was sleeping, she was climbing down those twisting stairs back into the sanctuary's underground chamber, the stone well where the entity erupted from, the glowing maps of the universe on the walls. I wish we'd forgotten more answers from I wish we'd gotten more answers from that place. Find anything useful? She shrugs. It's still there, the entity. I can feel it spreading out from within the sanctuary, although I don't know for what purpose. I can still see the glow deep down in that well. But you were hoping for some advice? Marina nods, chuckling softly. I had hoped it might guide us. Tell us what we should do next. I'm not surprised that the entity living inside the sanctuary, apparently the source of power, didn't poke its head out for another visit with Marina. We were f When we first encountered the entity, it seemed almost amused with us, happy to be awoken, sure, but in no rush to help us. 
win the war against the Mogadorians. I remember something it said during our conversation, that it bestows its gifts on a species. It doesn't judge or take sides, not even in its own defense. I think we've already gotten as much help from the entity as we're going to get. I keep this thought to myself, not wanting to discourage Marina or shake her faith, which seems to be mostly keeping her together, even if it does lead her to some morbid ethical questions that I frankly don't feel like thinking about. I've been sitting out here praying on, the situ on our situation, Marina continues. I suppose it's silly to hope for some kind of sign. I don't know what else to do with myself, though. Before I can respond, a shrill buzzing sounds a shrill buzzing sounds from behind us. At first, I think it's only Adam's latest attempt to create a new conduit. The noise is too close, though. It's coming, pr it's coming from practically right on top of us. Marina's grinning at me, her eyes wide and excited. My heart starts to beat harder as I realize what's happening. Maybe Marina's prayers actually worked. Six, aren't you going to answer it? The thing's been annoyingly silent for so long I'd forgotten what the ringer on the satellite phone sounds like. I jump up, yanking the phone out of the back of my pants. Marina stands with me, leaning her head in close to listen, and Adam jogs over to join us. I can feel Pira Dunra watching us, but I ignore her. John? There's a burst of static as the satellite phone establishes a connection, a familiar voice coming through between squeals of interference. Six? It's Sam! A wide smile spreads across my face. I can hear the relief in Sam's voice that I answered. Sam! My own voice breaks a little. I hope he doesn't hear it over our crackly connection. Actually, I don't care. Marina grabs my arm, grinning wider. You're okay? I ask Sam, the words coming out half question and half exclamation. I'm okay, he shouts. And John? John, too. We're at a military encampment in Brooklyn. They loaned us a pair of satellite phones, and John's talking to Sarah on the other one. I snort and can't help rolling my eyes a little. Of course he is. Where are you guys? Is everyone all right? Sam asks. Things have gotten nuts. Everything's fine, but before I can before I can tell Sam about our predicament, he interrupts. Did anything happen down there, Six, while you were at the sanctuary? Like, for instance, did you push a button for legacies or something? There weren't any buttons, I say, exchanging a look with Marina. We met, I don't know. Lorraine itself, Marina says. We met an entity, I tell Sam. It said some cryptic stuff, thanked us for waking it up, and then, um... Spread out into the earth, Marina finishes for me. Oh, hi, Marina, Sam says distractedly. Listen, I think this entity of yours might have, uh, spread out into me. What the hell does that mean, Sam? I've got legacies, Sam replies. There's such a strong mixture of excitement and pride in his voice that it's impossible for me not to imagine Sam puffing out his chest a bit, looking like he did right after we kissed for the first time. Well, just telekinesis. That's always the first one, isn't it? You've got legacies? I exclaim, looking wide-eyed at the others. Marina's hand tightens on my arm, and she turns to look at the sanctuary. Meanwhile, Adam's expression turns thoughtful as he looks down at his own hands, maybe wondering what his development says, what this development says about his own legacies. And I'm not the only one, Sam continues. We met another girl in New York by chance who had gotten powers, too. Who knows how many new guard are out there? I shake my head, trying to digest all this information. I find myself staring at the sanctuary, too, thinking about the entity hidden within. It worked, I say quietly. It actually worked. Marina faces me, tears in her eyes. We're homesick, she says. We've brought Lori in here. We've changed the world. It all sounds great, but I'm not ready to celebrate just yet. We're still stranded in Mexico. The war isn't suddenly over. That entity didn't give you a list of new guard, did it? Sam asks. Some way for us to find them? No list, I reply. I can't say for sure, but judging by my conversation with the entity, it all seems pretty random. What's happening there? I ask Sam, steering the conversation towards the battles we've been missing. We heard about the attack on New York. It's bad, Six, Sam says, grin grimness creeping into his voice. Manhattan is, like, on fire. We don't know where Nine is. He's still out there somewhere. We are. Where are you guys? We could really use your help. I realize that I never finished telling Sam about our current situation. There are mogs guarding the sanctuary, I tell him. We got all of them but one. While we were inside the temple, she wrecked all the ships. We're stuck here. You think you could get your new friends in the military to send a jet? We need to be picked up. Wait, you're still in Mexico? At the sanctuary? I don't like the fear in Sam's voice. Something's not right. What's wrong, Sam? You need to get out of there, Sam says. Sotrekas Ra has his, and his big-ass warship are heading right for you. Chapter 11. 
A few minutes after, Agent Walker tells me I've got 48 hours to win a war, a pair of soldiers in full-body armor and a middle-aged civilian carrying a tablet device arrive at her tent. They want to deliver some kind of urgent report related to the recording the civilian made on his tablet that morning. I'm not paying much attention. My ears are ringing, heart pounding. I can feel the new arrival stealing looks at me, like I'm a cross between a celebrity and a unicorn. That doesn't help my feeling that the tent walls are slowly closing in. I think I might be having a panic attack. Agent Walker takes one look at me and holds up her hand, stopping the soldiers from saying anything more. Let's take a walk, gentlemen, she says. I need the fresh air. Walker ushers the three men out of her tent and follows them, pausing at the exit. She looks back at me, grimacing like she's in pain. I know she probably wants to say something comforting or encouraging, and I also know that Agent Walker simply isn't equipped for that. Take a few minutes, she says gently, and that's probably the most empathy I've ever seen from her. I'm fine, I reply sharply, although I know I don't feel fine. Not at all. I'm rooted in place and struggling to keep my breathing even. Of course, I know that, Walker says. Just, I don't know. You've had a rough 24 hours. Take a breath. I'll be back in a few minutes. As soon as Walker's gone, I immediately collapse into the chair in front of her laptop. I shouldn't be taking a minute. There's too much to do. My body isn't cooperating, though. This isn't like the exhaustion I was pushing through yesterday. It's something else. My hands are shaking, and I can hear my heartbeat thumping loud in my head. It reminds me of yesterday's explosions, the screams, the dead, running for my life, passing by the corpses of people I wasn't good enough to save, and more of that to come. Unless I do can do the Im impossible. I feel like I'm going to throw up. Needing something to focus on, trying to pull me out of this funk, I turn on Walker's laptop. I know what I'm hoping to find, what I need to hear. In addition to the video she showed me of Satrekis Ross' threat, Walker has a few other files open on her desktop. I'm not at all surprised to see the video I'm looking for there already open. Fight for Earth. Support the Lorg. I turn the volume up and click play. This is our planet, but we are not alone. Daniela was right. Sarah does sound like she's trying to come off as older and more professional than she actually is, like a newscaster or documentarian. It makes me smile all the same. I close my eyes and listen to her voice. I don't even necessarily listen to the words, although it's definitely nice to hear your girlfriend describe you as a hero to the human race. Hearing Sarah's voice starts to settle my nerves, but it also creates a feeling of longing that I've been too panicked to indulge over the last couple of days. I imagine us back in paradise, way more innocent, hanging out in my bedroom while Henry's out running errands. I'm not sure how many times I've replayed the clip before Sam enters Walker's tent. He clears his throat to get my attention and holds up a satellite phone in each hand. Mission accomplished, Sam says. He cranes his neck to see the laptop screen. What are you watching? The, um, this video that Sarah made, I reply, feeling embarrassed. Of course, Sam doesn't know that I've just played the video a dozen times, that I'm listening to my girlfriend's voice to try to attain some kind of zen state. I sit up straight and try to look into, like, the strong leader in video, the video portrays me to me as. Is it awesome? Sam asks, coming over. He sets one of the phones down next to me. It's... I trail off, not sure what to say about the video. It's pretty corny, actually. But right now, it's also kind of the greatest thing ever. Sam nods and pats my shoulder, understanding. Why don't you just call her? Sarah? Yeah. I'll call six and check in with Team Sanctuary, he says, sounding eager. Find out where they are. Maybe they've, uh, maybe they've already made it back to Ashwood Estates. I'll let them know what's up with us, and we'll figure out a place to meet. I should probably call my dad, too. Let him know I'm alive. I realize Sam is looking at me the same way that Walker did, like I'm suddenly fragile. I shake my head and start to stand up, but Sam puts a hand on my shoulder. Seriously, dude? He says. Call your girlfriend. She's got to be worried sick. I let Sam push me back into the chair. All right, I say. But if anything's happened to Six and the others, or you can't reach them, I'll come get you right away, Sam says as he heads out. Trouble turning the page. Hold on. As he heads towards the exit, I'll give you some privacy until the next crisis. When Sam's gone, I push both my hands through my hair and leave them there, squeezing my head like I'm literally trying to keep it together. After a moment of composing myself, I reach for the phone Sam left behind and punch in the number that I've committed to memory. Sarah answers on the third ring, breathless and hopeful. John? You have no idea how badly I needed to hear your voice, I reply, glancing sidelong at Walker's laptop screen and finally closing it. I press the phone tight to my ear, shut my eyes, and imagine Sarah is sitting next to me. I was so worried, John. I saw... We all saw what happened in New York. I have to bite the inside of my cheek. The image of Sarah I was calling up in my mind's eyes replaced by one of, build, of the buildings crumbling under the bombardment of the Anubis. It was... I don't know what to say about it, I tell her. I feel lucky to have made it out. I don't mention the guilt I've been feeling or how hard it has been to keep going. I don't want Sarah to know that about me. I want to be the heroic guy from her video. 
Sarah doesn't say anything for a few seconds. I can hear her breathing, slow and shaky, the way it gets when she's trying to keep her emotions from bubbling out. When she finally speaks, her voice is a quiet and desperate whisper coming far from far away. It was so horrible, John. All those poor people. They're dying. The world's basically ending. And all, all I could think about was what might have happened to you. Why you weren't calling. I don't... I don't have a charm on my ankle to keep track of you. I don't... I didn't know if... I realize that Sarah's relief at hearing my voice is the angry kind. The kind that comes when you've spent sleepless nights worrying about a person. I remember how it felt when the Mogadorians had taken her. How it felt like a piece of me was missing. I also remember how much simpler things were then. Avoid the Mogs. Rescue Sarah. There weren't millions of lives hanging in the balance. Crazy to think that used to seem like a crisis. My sat phone got destroyed, or I would have called sooner. We made it to, the, to Brooklyn, where the army has set up. I'm fine. I reassure her, knowing that I'm partly trying to convince myself. I felt like a ghost these last couple of days, Sarah says quietly. Mark and me, we've been hitting the internet hard, working on projects to help, you know, win hearts and minds. And we finally met Guard in person, which, oh my god, John, I have so much to tell you, but I need you to know first that during all this keeping busy, I felt like I'm just going through the motions, like I'm out of body, because all I could think about was you getting blown up with those people in New York. I should ask Sarah about the identity of the mysterious hacker she and Mark have been working with. I should find out the details of what she and Mark have been doing. I should know. I know I should, except in that moment, all I can think about is how much I miss her. I know part of the reason you went to find Mark was because you didn't want to be a distraction, I say, trying to sound more reasonable than desperate. Not being able to talk to you, to see you, to touch you, that might be a bigger distraction than anything. You've been helping so much, but... I miss you too, Sarah replies, and I can tell when she speaks that she's trying to find her resolve, to be tough like she was when I dropped her off at the bus station in Baltimore. We made the right decision, though. It's better this way. It was a stupid decision, I reply. John... I don't know how I let you talk me into this. I continue. We should never separate. We should have never separated. After everything that happened in New York, everything I had to see. My breath catches for a moment as I remember the fires, the destruction, the wounded, and the dead. I realize that I'm shaking again and definitely not from exhaustion. I feel like I might have hit my limit. Like there's only so much brutality my brain can endure. I try to focus on Sarah and on getting my words out, on making sense and not sounding too desperate. I need you with me, Sarah. I manage to finish. I feel like... These are the last battles we're ever going to fight. After New York, I, I've seen how quickly it can be all be taken away. I don't want us to be apart if something happens, if this is the end. Sarah gathers a deep breath. When she speaks next, her voice is firm. This is not the end, John. I realize how I must sound to her, weak and scared, not at all like the alien hero she, she portrayed in that video. I'm embarrassed by how I'm acting, alone for the first time since the attack in New York, without constant skirmishes to distract me, with things finally slowed down enough for me to think. The result is me breaking down while on the phone with my girlfriend. We've been in bad situations before, fought some brutal battles, and seen friends die, but until now, I've never felt hopeless. When I'm silent for a few moments, Sarah continues, her voice gentle. I can't imagine what, it's, what it was like. To be in the New York, to be in New York during that, I can't imagine what you're going through. It was my fault it happened. I tell her quietly, glancing to the tent flap in case someone might overhear us. I could have killed Sir Trekus Roth, the UN. I had time to prepare for this invasion, and I failed. Oh, John, you cannot possibly blame yourself for New York. Sarah replies, her tone understanding but insistent. You were not responsible for the murderous rampage of an alien psycho. Okay, you were trying to stop him. But I didn't. Yeah, and neither did anyone else. So either all of us are equally to blame, or maybe it's the evil Mogadorian's fault, and we can leave it at that. Your guilt isn't going to bring anyone back, John, but you can avenge them. You can stop Satrekis Ram from doing it again. I laugh bitterly. That's just it. I don't know how to stop him. It's too much. We'll find a way, Sarah replies, and her certainty almost convinces me. We'll do this together, all of us. I rub my hands over my face, trying to get myself together. Sarah's telling me exactly what I need to hear. As usual, I know she's right, at least on a logical level. But that doesn't loosen the knot of guilt tying up my guts or make the future seem any less overwhelming. They look at me like a hero, I say, scoffing. I walk around this camp and the soldiers, the survivors, everyone looks at me like I'm some kind of Superman. They don't know. I guess my video really worked. Sarah quips, trying to lighten the mood. They look at you that way because you are a hero, John. I shake my head. 
They don't know what I have no idea. They don't know that I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to fight a battle on this scale. Nine's missing. Ella's taken and basically getting tortured. I don't want... I don't know what's taking Six and the others so long to get back from the sanctuary, but when they do, we might have to go back anyway because that's right where Satarkas Ra is headed. Meanwhile, there are 25 warships over 25 different cities. I don't know how to deal with this, Sarah. Well... Sarah replies, her voice calm and collected, like I haven't just dropped an insurmountable pile of problems at her feet. It's a good thing you've got friends. Now, let's take this one thing at a time. Let me tell you about Guard. Okay, that was the end of Chapter 11. We'll pick up on Chapter 12 in the next video. I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. And that's it for now. Until next time, reading by Ree. Bye, guys.